I don't know if you've had much experience with of thieves. I was going to say of thieving then. I hope that's much less experience of that. Um, but one of my earliest recollections of uh, having been exposed to a thief was when I, I guess I was probably about seven or eight years old and um, my grandma paid for us uh, to go on holiday to Wales for a few days. Uh, I say she paid for us because um, my dad didn't have any money. So um, if we got a holiday, then if she paid, it meant she got to come with us. So uh, my grandma paid. And we stayed in a little hotel in Wales. It was a bit Faulty Towers-ish, as I recall. Um, and it had a very odd key system where when you left your room and locked your room, there was a board on, in the hallway where you would hang your key as you, as you, as you left the room. <laughs> I mean... I never can't imagine now looking back a more ridiculous security system on the planet. <laughs> anyway, one evening we all went down for dinner and uh, my dad, who, who was a rule follower, uh, hung, hung the key against the number of the room. So there was a, a big board with all the room numbers and you would hang your key on the way down. I mean, it's inevitable what's going to happen, right? And we went, we went down for dinner one evening and um, we seemed a little shocked, I recall, as we got back after dinner and the room had been completely ransacked. And I do recall, even as a child, I think, saying to Dad, we did give them the key. I mean, uh, <laughs> and uh, there's no better way to know when a thief is coming than when you hang your room up, uh, key up on, as you leave the room, right? <laughs> to say, I'm not there, please, please go on ahead. And uh, anyway, the room got ransacked, and I remember, I, it was quite a vivid uh, recollection, probably more for the Faulty Towers-esque experience than it was, but... Uh, what the, but the other abiding thing that I recall about it was, my dad's philosophy was, and in fact, if anything, I think he felt a bit sorry for them, because despite the fact they'd ransacked the room, there was nothing to take. <laughs> uh, we had nothing of any value to a thief. And it's one of the things I loved about my dad, because my dad had no desire or appeal for anything of any value. Uh, and so we never had any such thing. So... Uh, I think he was almost inclined to leave a note and apologise that it had been a fruitless, uh, a fruitless experience for them and there was nothing worth taking. And, uh, and this is an important issue, isn't it, now for us brothers and sisters, because when the thief comes, the question is, is there something for him to take? You only feel a sense of loss, right? If something is taken from you that you regret losing... That's the challenge for us, isn't it? And what we just want to think about for a few moments now before we finish is, the thief who is coming is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the thief. Only six times this little metaphor is used in scripture, and they come in three pairs. I don't know if you've noticed it. There's one in Matthew 24, which is part of the Olivet Prophecy, uh, which, is, uh, which is a fundamental basis for the Apostle Paul, in this, particularly in this last couple of chapters of Thessalonians. There's, a, there's an almost identical version in Luke's uh, gospel account as well. So they're the two occasions when it comes directly from the mouth of the Lord Jesus. Peter repeats it, if you remember, in his letter. Paul repeats it here in 1 Thessalonians 5. So you've two in the gospels, two in the letters, and then the last two, of course, come in Revelation. And we just read one of them there in the letter to Sardis. And by the time you get to Revelation, in the gospels and in the letters... It's a little bit oblique, isn't it? The day of the Lord is coming like a thief. By the time you get to the record of Revelation, brothers and sisters, there's no question who the thief is. I am coming as a thief. And it's Jesus speaking in the first person. Twice he says it. In the letter to Sardis that we read, and in chapter 16 and verse 15 of Revelation, I am coming as a thief. And the thing that's most in fear of being lost is your garments. On both occasions, blessed is he, we read in Sardis, who, he who overcomes will walk with me in white garments. And in Revelation 16, if you remember, it says, blessed is he who keeps his garments so that they, they do not see his shame. So the thing we're most in fear of losing, brothers and sisters, is our garments with all of that metaphor that it means in, in Scripture. But it's worth thinking for a couple of moments, brothers and sisters, about we know a couple of thieves in the Bible, don't we? We're introduced to a couple of thieves. Judas, we're told, was a thief. And I don't know if you remember the moment when John tells us that Judas was a thief. Do you remember when it was? It was, in, it was at that meal 
the resurrection meal that we were looking at yesterday. Do you remember? Lazarus, come forth. And subsequently that evening, Jesus sat down for a meal with a man who'd been raised from the dead. And the following day, these two great companies would come out to meet the Lord, waving their palm branches and crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that evening, there was a woman who broke a very expensive box of spikenard. And there was a man there who wanted that box. He said it would have been better if we'd have uh, sold this and given the proceeds to the poor. And John said, Judas said that not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And that was on the day of the Lord. The, when, when Jesus had come and cried, Lazarus, come forth. And there was a man there, brothers and sisters, who was a thief. And you know, the result of being in that house that night for that thief was he went away empty handed. He did not get what he wanted that night because the Lord was there. And do you remember the Lord's answer? He said to Judas and the disciples who, who were stood around what this woman has done. She did, he said, for my burial. And there was no way the Lord was going to allow that which that woman had prepared to be taken by the thief. And he left that night, brothers and sisters, empty-handed. And he went and covenanted to try and get some money somewhere else, as you recall. And in fact, it was only a couple of days later, as Jesus made his way into Jerusalem, that we meet the next group of thieves. Do you remember as the Lord Jesus walked into the temple precincts there on his last trip into Jerusalem? And he'd done it a couple of years before, hadn't he? When he'd first arrived in his ministry and he cleared out the temple of those that bought and sold in the temple courts there. And he arrived at the temple for one last time. And in those three and a half years, brothers and sisters, nothing had changed. And he took the whips, if you remember, and he turned out those who were buying and selling in the temple. And he said to them, this, this house was suppo supposed to be called by all nations a house of prayer. And you have turned it, he said, into a den of thieves. And again, it was in that moment as he rode into Jerusalem, the day of the Lord came like a thief. And, and there was a great irony, brothers and sisters, that the thieves who made a practice of thieving discovered that they were the ones who were being theft from. I'm not even sure that's a word. <laughs> they were the ones who were being robbed and stolen because the Lord Jesus Christ came to take away from them the things that they regarded as valuable, the commerce and, and their, their, uh, their status and their, 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 their livelihoods that were being made out of the practice of what should have been a divine and a holy thing. And the Lord Jesus Christ came and he took it and he stole it. And they came running after him. By what authority do you do these things? Right? And that's, that will be the great challenge for us, brothers and sisters, won't it? On the day when the Lord Jesus comes. Whether we've got so many things in our life that are so valuable to us, we don't want to see them lost. Or whether in actual fact the things that are of the most value to us are the things that Jesus will bring with him. Blessed is he who overcomes and he will walk in, in new white garments. They are the things that Jesus will bring with him, right? And all those garments that we've been wearing for all this time will, be, will suddenly be of no value and they'll be gone. And that's the, that's the sense of the loss and the risk here. And in 1 Thessalonians 5 here, the Apostle Paul very carefully picks up on this parable from, uh, from the, um, the Olivet Prophecy. Will you just turn with, to me with me to it in Matthew 24. I wanted to, sh I only had one slide for you. I didn't manage to get my slides up yesterday. I'm not going to manage today because it's still not working. As that's how, how uh, carefully planned this was. And I only had one slide for you today, which was just to show you the number of references there are between Paul's letter to the Thessalonians and this, this Olivet prophecy. And he had a screen full of them for you, so I'm sure you can download it later. Uh, and to be honest, I haven't got time to take you through it anyway, and I would have only got digressed on it. But it's worth just going through with your, with your pen and making note of all the, the unmistakable allusions that the Apostle Paul makes there in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, particularly if you accept that the Olivet Prophecy extends beyond uh, the end of Matthew chapter 24 and into Matthew chapter 25. And we'll, we'll just look at a couple of them in a minute, but you'll, 
you'll have to do the homework yourself, yourself I'm afraid, to, uh, to, to pick them up. But of course, we've, we've noticed before already this weekend that the, the Thessalonian motifs are here, aren't they? The, the Lord coming in the clouds, as Stephen has shared with us, um, uh, with the sound of the trumpet, verse 31, and sending his angels to gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And uh, Jesus begins a couple of parables, one of which are included here is the, the thief as you come towards the end of this chapter, verse 43, know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and not suffered his house to be broken up. Can you imagine how surprised the thief would have been, brothers and sisters, in my hotel in Wales, if having taken the key off the hook and walked in the room, I was sat there waiting for him, right? Wouldn't that be amazing if when the Lord comes, because this is a matter of perspective, isn't it? It depends on how you see it. The Lord is not a thief for those who have nothing to take away. Is he? And if he, if he comes and finds us sat there, as, as Stephen described this morning, sat ready and waiting, I'm here, good to go, then there's no thieving to be done, right? No loss to be endured, only gain to be had. Not many thieves come and give you gifts, right? They normally take. The Lord will come with dual aspect, and it depends on your perspective, doesn't it? And may it be, brothers and sisters, for us. And that's the point of the, the Apostle Paul makes there in 1 Thessalonians 5, for us that he does not come as a thief. That will not be how you will experience, as the Apostle Paul, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But just look at the next parable that occurs here in, in Matthew chapter 24. Verse 44. Be ye also ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord has made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, will find so doing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he will make him ruler over all his goods. So this is the dual uh, perception now, isn't it? This is what will happen to those who are ready and waiting when, when the Lord comes. But, verse 48... If that evil servant will say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming. And I want you to notice that phrase, brothers and sisters, because you've heard it before. Where was Jesus taking this parable from? My Lord delays his coming. Because there was a group of people who made this statement, brothers and sisters, and it's in Exodus chapter 32. Will you just come back with me one last time this weekend to these events at Sinai in the record of Exodus? My Lord delays his coming. And I believe Jesus picked that phrase, brothers and sisters, right out of Exodus 32. And you'll, you'll spot it straight away. Moses has been up in the mountain for 40 days and he's going to return to the wilderness floor and face the golden calf. And this way you've got to read so slowly. Here it is in verse 1, look. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming. And this is, this is what Jesus was quoting from, I believe, and I'll show you why in a second. And I told you this morning, you hadn't heard the shout yet. We heard the voice of the archangel and we heard the first trumpet. In a moment, you're going to hear the shout, which completes Paul's trilogy in 1 Thessalonians 5. And the thing that was going to precipitate it, brothers and sisters, was there was a generation of people here on the wilderness floor who heard the trumpet. They would heard the voice of the angel speaking out of the midst of the fire. And when they saw Moses disappear up into that cloud... You know, and you can see all the images now, can't you? This is like the Lord ascending for the first time, as Stephen's taken us through this weekend. And their conclusion after six weeks was, my Lord delays his coming. And the direct effect, the impact of that decision of my Lord delays his coming was, well, come on, let's, uh, let's chuck our stuff in the fire and make us gods which will uh, take us back to Egypt. That was the outcome of that belief. My Lord delays his coming. Now just come back a couple of pages to, um, to Exodus chapter 24. Just, just listen to the very last thing that Moses said to them before he was taken up from them into the cloud. 
Exodus chapter 24. You remember this extraordinary scene. It's almost as if Moses conducts a breaking of bread service, a a memorial service here in Exodus 24, as he erects 12 pillars around an altar with the oxen and the bullocks, and he offers the the, uh, the burnt offering and the peace offering, and he has everybody uh, watching, and he takes the blood and he sprinkles it. And these are the words that are used in, uh, in Hebrews, aren't they, to describe... The foretaste of the new covenant. These are the words that Jesus himself used here in Exodus 24 at the Last Supper. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you. And he picks those words right out of Exodus 24, this this memorial service that Moses holds here on the wilderness floor in the sight of all the people. And at the end of that, Moses in verse 13 rises up and his minister Joshua and Moses went up into the Mount of God. And these were the last words Moses said to the elders as he left them there on Mount Sinai. Verse 14. Tarry ye here for us until we come again unto you. And in verse 15, Moses went up into the mount and a cloud covered the mount and the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai. Can you see this lovely image that's being played out here? This is the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? Wait for me. The same Jesus whom you saw taken up from you will so come in like manner as you saw him go. And what was Moses going up to receive? What what, what fills Exodus chapters end, end of 24 all the way through to Exodus 31? It's the receipt of the tabernacle, isn't it? I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to prepare a a place in the Father's house. And that's why God repeatedly in those chapters said to Moses, isn't it? Make make sure you make it exactly according to the pattern. In my Father's house are many mansions and I will come and receive you unto myself. And the very method of uh, bringing down the pattern of the tabernacle from Moses in, in pattern type was so that God could build a sanctuary for him and his people to be together there. That's what Moses got up to receive. And he came down with all of that pattern in his head, didn't he? Carrying the tables of the testimony. And in chapter 32 and verse 1, when the people saw that Moses delayed, my Lord delays his coming. Do you remember what Jesus turned that into in his parable in In Matthew 24, if that evil servant will say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming. And he says that they end up getting drunk and beating each other up and doing the very opposite of building one another up. They beat one another up. And as Moses climbs down Mount Sinai here, of course, he he witnesses the things that are going on here on the wilderness floor. And now you need to hear the shout. And you know it, you know it ever so well. When Moses saw the dancing and the calf, it said his anger waxed hot and he broke the tablets and he stood up in the camp and he cried. So we've had the the sound of the trumpet, the voice of the archangel. Now you're going to hear the shout. Who is on the Lord's side? That was the shout that Israel heard, brothers and sisters, when the Lord came. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come. And he came, and he came with vengeance. Who is on the Lord's side? And it wasn't everybody that came, was it, brothers and sisters? When that shout was heard, it didn't penetrate the ears of everybody, did it? Who was it that came to Moses' side? Can you remember? It was the Levites. And on that very day, brothers and sisters, when the Levites came to be with Moses, God said, I will make a covenant with you that will be an everlasting covenant of priesthood. And they got it, brothers and sisters, because when they heard the shout of the coming Lord, they responded and they came and they made themselves available. And the next thing Moses said was, gird ye every man his sword by his side and take vengeance on your brethren and put out this evil from the camp. I mean, you can't miss the, 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 the magic of the, um, this unfolding drama, can you, here? In, in this moment. Well, come with me finally then back to the New Testament, back to the Olivet Prophecy in Matthew 25, as I believe Matthew, uh, the Lord Jesus, sorry, continues his discourse of, um, of the Olivet Prophecy into Matthew 25. And, and we said this morning, we've heard the two of the three motifs in, in Matthew 24. You've got the sound of the trumpet. You've got the angels gathering the elect from the four winds of heaven. What about the shout then in the Olivet Prophecy? Where was the Apostle Paul taking that from? Well, it's in chapter 25, I think, brothers and sisters. And again, you know it ever so well, because it's buried in a little, another little parable. 
Verse 1 of Matthew 25, the kingdom of heaven will be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Isn't that lovely? That's the words of the Apostle Paul, isn't it, in 1 Thessalonians 4. That when the bridegroom comes, they will go out to meet him. That's what we've been talking about all weekend, isn't it? And that's what they were waiting for, these, these, uh, these virgins. They were waiting for the bridegroom to arrive. And he was late. Different in Eastern culture, normally the bride's late for us. But the Lord delayed his coming, or so they thought. And do you notice what happened? Do you remember what happened to those virgins, brothers and sisters? It says in verse 5, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And this is the metaphor now of 1 Thessalonians 4, isn't it? But at a very specific time, at midnight, there was a cry. And it woke every single one of those virgins. Nobody, nobody missed the cry. They didn't all have oil in their lamps. But none of them, none of them missed the sound of the shout. At midnight, verse 6, there was a cry made. And here it comes. This was the cry. This was the shout that the Apostle Paul, I think, was referring to. And here it comes. Behold, the bridegroom comes. Go ye out to meet him. That's 1 Thessalonians 4, isn't it? Go ye out to meet him. And only half of them, brothers and sisters, made it into that marriage feast when the bridegroom came. Well, our our weekend reaches its end then. Will you just end with me in Luke's account, this same account, just in Luke's gospel? Because as we leave this weekend, brothers and sisters, we just have to get our perspectives in check, don't we, as we leave this place and as you face your life and I face mine tomorrow. It's about our perspective, isn't it, as to how we see the Lord coming. Whether we see him coming to give us salvation and redemption, you know, whether we hear the joyful sound of the trumpet call or whether we see a thief coming and we're fearful of those things he will take from us when he comes and we hear the air raid siren. You know, that, that's the choice we've got to make. Uh, and and uh, uh, only we can make that choice, can't we? Okay, only we can know that the, the priorities that we've made in our lives and, and the, the dedication of our hearts and minds is, is sufficient to a degree that we can rely enough on the grace of God that when we hear that shout and when we hear that trumpet, it will fill us with joy. And I want you to notice the pronouns that Luke uses. Luke chapter 21 and verse 25 And I think I used to panic as a child. Again, this was a common Sunday evening lecture chapter when I was a kid about men's hearts failing them for fear. And I remember thinking, oh boy, maybe I need to be, maybe I need to be in that boat, you know, when the Lord comes, I need to be absolutely trembling in my boots. That's, That's how it ought to be. But when you read carefully the pronouns here, Brent, of course, that's not how it ought to be. There will be signs, verse 25, in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear. Men's hearts, not yours. Men's hearts failing them for fear. Um, For those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken and then shall they see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. That's what they will see. But when these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Verse 34, take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life. Here it comes. And so that day come upon you unawares, for as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth, on them. There's a very big distinction in these passages, brothers and sisters, between they and you. They and you. And they will respond very differently to you and I, brothers and sisters, when we hear that voice. And so our final words then are these, brothers and sisters. Verse 36. Watch ye therefore and pray always. That you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man.